Hi guys, good morning. A lot of familiar faces. Um, yeah, nice to see you, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction, um, Asma. Well, the slides, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm a solutions architect. Uh, I've worked with most of you guys in the audience. A um, bit about me, uh, about, about, uh, apart from my solutions architecture role, uh, I was one of the initial committers of WS2 API Manager product. A uh, long time back, uh, did some early implementation of the developer portal, uh, which we are going to rewrite this year. Um, yeah, so I've been involved with WS2 for about close to 10 years now, uh, doing, you know, having various roles in the company. Um, yeah, nice to be here and nice to talk about the API marketplace aspect and give an introduction to this uh, entire track. Uh, my colleague Nuan Dias, another Nuan, um, he'll, he'll talk about the in-depth details of the product uh, and our vision towards the API, uh, API strategy, etc. cetera. Um, all right, so to, to start off with, um, I want to take a minute and talk about uh, the application economy. Uh, I know it, it is not about, well, what you're familiar about is the API economy, but I want to talk a little about the application economy. Um, and, um, and if you think about it, every, uh, every commerce platform that we are interacting with, Amazon or uh, you know, uh, anything that you buy, something you buy, you, you know the mobile version of that, right? Uh, because you spend more, most of your time with your phone and you have an application installed in your phone and, um, and you, you are more familiar with the mobile application of that version of that application, right? Uh, so that means we are interacting more with applications uh, and the application economy is defining the world right now. It's a, it's a $6 trillion business uh, by 2021 uh, globally. Um, so it's a big deal. So every one of us, if we are buying something, if we are you know, communicating with somebody, we are doing that through an application. To, you know, put everything into context, it's actually bigger than Hollywood, right? This slightly older model, but it's, it shows 2014 uh, numbers, but it, it's a huge revenue stream, a huge uh, money maker uh, right now. You've heard about this, right? Uh, or a slightly uh, uh, different flair of this phrase. Um, so if you're thinking about you know, building an application, there needs to be an API behind that application so you can build an e effective application, right? Uh, especially if it's a mobile application, it is a thin client. That means there has to be some kind of a backend behind it. You can't bundle then write the backend and put it into the mobile. It has to be a lightweight component. So uh, for that skin uh, is powered, or that data is uh, the data that comes into that skin is powered by APIs. So that's the main thing. This is a slide that I used uh, in even in my last uh, uh, conference talk, uh, which something I firmly believe that API always comes first. This was not uh, the de facto. If you think about like five years back, right? If we are thinking about backend implementations. Uh, how the data, how we pick data from data sources and present it to the outside world. Uh, we model that backend implementation. We think about relational databases, uh, think about modeling that, and then integration in the integration layer, et cetera. Um, we, we think about the consumability, uh, and it's a very narrowed vision of consumability of that data. We, we think about one application that is probably in the enterprise that wants to use that data, we don't think about other use cases, how other business units might use this data, how partners will use this data, how you know, other customers will use this data. We, we don't think about that much, uh, I would say five years ago, right? But today, most of these use cases are driven by the customers, partners that, that you know of, uh, and other business units probably have use cases to, uh, to use the data that you produce in your business unit. In that case, um, and they want to build their application and go to market very soon. Um, so the most uh, you know, the sensible option is give them a contract. right? So this is what we are planning to build. Uh, and obviously, it is not there yet. But this, this is the contract. This, this is what it, it will look like. So if you can build a solid contract and provide that contract in advance, uh, you can empower those end users or end application developers so they can build their stuff, they're not blocked because of you. 
right? So in parallel, everybody can work, and in parallel, everybody can go to the market. Um, in WC2 API Manager, we, we have these capabilities. You can write like a, a mock implementation and, and build it into the gateway. So every app developer uh, can use that mock implementation and get the data out and you know, show something so they can create a nice web application and do prototyping and all that stuff. And in parallel, you can build your implementation, the backend implementation. Uh, so that's the essence of it. So uh, I firmly believe that API comes first, and I've seen many implementations um, in, the, in the enterprises um, where you either build the mock implementation in the gateway itself, or you have a mock backend uh, which just emits some JSON data. Um, and an API economy is not really about monetizing the API. I know that there are certain organizations, they, they, um, they focus on monetizing the API. That's where, you know, that's where why we have the, um, the rate limiting, you know, gold, silver, unlimited kind of tiers and, uh, and put a dollar figure into one of those tiers. Uh, that's one way of generating revenue out of the APIs. When, when API economy became a thing, uh, like two, three years ago, Everybody thought that people will have a developer portal and it'll be like a marketplace and people start, uh, the consumers will start buying the access to the API. But that was not what really happened. Um, people bought APIs, people bought applications, people bought services and offerings that provided through applications, but not really paid the APIs. Um, uh, the big vendors like Google, Google Maps, they, they kind of monetize these map APIs and stuff like that. But generally, I haven't seen a lot of em enterprises creating money out of you know, usage, API usage. Um, it's more about what I've seen is speed to market. If you, have a, if you are exposing a, a solid API platform to your vendors, to your partners, customers, they, they can build application and go to the market um, sooner, and they can really share that revenue with you. Um, they, they can uh, sell your products uh, through their applications. Probably they have a better application ecosystem. And because of that, you get a revenue, you get a revenue share out of that. And it's also really about knowing the unknown, right? If you are a big organization with you know, hundreds of BUs um, uh, globally distributed, uh, you probably might not know why some business units what some business units are doing in, in Asia Pacific in, in Europe. You probably don't know. Uh, if but if if those organizations, if those business units have their own API marketplaces, you can try to you know consume those APIs and see what these guys are doing. And for them and for those business units, they can really get an understanding how their data, how their services are used um, and, and get an understanding. Probably, if, if they, they are constrained to their business unit and you know, exposing services um, and focused on those products, probably they don't know what they don't know. That's kind of a situation. You can really experiment um, with the economics. You can experiment with the behavioral economics of uh, you know, how products are used. That's what you know, Amazon is doing if I, if I bought something and uh, it'll show in a right-hand side uh, pane that you might be interested in these products as well, right? That means a lot of big data analytics going on behind the scene to understand my, my buying patterns. All those are data-driven, API-driven uh, use cases. So I think rather than trying to monetize an API by, by restraining the access, if you openly provide access to the API, you can get more benefits um, and you can open up or you can def uh, you know, think about or uh, discover more revenue streams in that way. Um, so the, the topic of this talk is really about the API marketplace, the enterprise version, right? Um, and, and if you think about it, uh, we all try to expose our APIs to the outside world and, and get everybody to use our services or um, our, uh, our products or services. Uh, but then some organizations are really messy in their backends. Their in-houses are really, really a mess. It's not, they can't really communicate within the company. So there are a lot of siloed uh, uh, processes. Um, so uh, as I said, so silos, siloed business units 
uh, really, um, it kills that innovation. It, uh, you, you won't be able to share that, uh, those information, and you'll be building repetitive things, right? Um, you probably have multiple identity uh, uh, systems in those organizations. You can't share data easily. You don't have APIs. There's, uh, most of the time, the integrations are file-based. You ask somebody to give a file, and OK, I'll, I'll upload it, or a batch process just takes some data and upload another system. There are no real-time integration, no API integration, et cetera. Um, so there are decades-old uh, cross-view integrations, as I said, file drops, batch processes. And, uh, and really, when you think about the enterprise systems, those are not like startup-based kind of technologies that we are talking about. There are a lot of technical debt, right? There are mainframes to new microservice-based systems which you have to deal with. And, and you have to deal with them to, in order to expose some, uh, some services, some data. Because m probably the most critical data, most critical, critical services are still residing in those old mainframe systems. So you might have to write a wrapper. Uh, you might have to you know, break the monolith and create a bunch of services. And that takes reengineering. That takes effort. Um, so I know it is easy for me to say that just don't give me a file and just give me an API. But in, in the real world, it's kind of most complex because you have to deal with a lot of different technologies, a lot of different legacy uh, things, et cetera. So you have to have a proper plan in order to uh, go to this API economy base or API market based practices, uh, or you know, think about that monolith, breaking down, mon down that monolith into multiple services, et cetera. Um, and also, I highly believe that the innovation is driven by agility, uh, which is one of the themes in, uh, in this conference as well. Uh, and, and that is one of the reasons why startups are winning the application economy. Right? I was engaged with one of the customers um, who is issuing um, uh, mortgages. It's one of the largest mortgage providers in the US for last, uh, I, I think, 50, 70 years kind of time frame. It's a big company. But they are threatened by small Silicon Valley-based startups like uh, this Rocket Mortgage. And, uh, and if you think about it, have you ever thought of like, getting a mortgage just from a mobile application? Apparently, their main, uh, main uh, revenue stream or uh, main way of making money is through their mobile application. right? So, um, so yeah, so that's... Uh, so that's the that's reality of it. And they have a huge advantage because they have a greenfield technology. They, they, can, they can start with microservices where the enterprises can't really do that because they have a lot of baggage uh, behind that they have to think about. Um, and the reality is uh, we have to have a nice, well-tuned feedback loop. To have a well-tuned feedback loop, if you have siloed business units, you can't really do that. So, uh, uh, so that's what we were talking about, and we have to figure out how to break that, break those barriers. And I firmly believe to break those barriers, I think APIs can help. If if the business units, even still, if they have uh, legacy systems, lot of baggage, if they can somehow wrap those services and expose as APIs and be more transparent to the rest of the organization, they can uh, create value and be a bit more agile um, and 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 power their application platforms. So, um, so let's think about the enterprise marketplaces. Uh, the, uh, when, when I talk about enterprise marketplace, I'm thinking about building an internal API marketplace for your organization, right? Uh, uh, rather than trying to expose everything to the outside world, this is about cleaning the house. Uh, let's look at the strength, right? So what are the strengths that you have when you compete with some startups, some, some organizations that have greenfield technology? You have domain-specific specialized business units. So that's an advantage, right? So uh, you have business units very focused on something, very focused on their services. They have experts on this area. Uh, a clear-cut process ownership. Each unit has own uh, IT operation or digital enablement team, right? So when you think about it, it's really what microservice is also defined by our micro It is really like microservice characteristics. If you think about a microservice, it's a, it's a domain model. It's, uh, you have to think about the business domain and how to model that. So if your business units, if you think about the business units like that, you can define it as a strength. 
Um, likewise, you have weaknesses. You have a lot of technical debt, like we talked about. Um, and then initial time investment and re-engineering, that will cost you some money and time and effort. Right? You have to do some re-engineering, you have to break the monoliths, you have to create services, etc. But you have a lot of opportunities. Uh, every BU can contribute to that investment that we talked about, that re-engineering investment that some business units trying to justify. All the business units can get together and, uh, and, and, and share that cost of operation. So we have seen this in, uh, with some of our customers, um, some state customers. All state agencies contributed to the, uh, the, uh, the central IT department in order to build this API ecosystem. So likewise, they, they share that cost, they share uh, cost of operation. And there can be potential new business opportunity that you, you never knew, right? That's, that's about knowing the unknown. And great agility and productivity in, uh, in, in sharing information. So there can be some business units that, that you didn't know that exist. So this is, a, uh, this is something that we often discover with when we interact with some large organizations. Uh, when I talk with the US counterparts, they really didn't know what the UK guys are doing. And, uh, and there is a new leads coming from the UK, the same organization of the UK branch. They're talking to the UK WSO2 sales engineers, uh, doing, uh, trying to do the same kind of thing that we are trying to do here in the US. Right? So there is no real sharing. So you can enable that kind of information sharing um, and make things more agile. And the feedback loop. right? So you can think about building an application and put it out to the market. But if you don't know how that application performs, and if you don't know uh, what APIs are mostly used, and if you can't innovate based on that feedback, it's kind of like it's, it's worthless, right? So you have to focus on the feedback loop. There can also be threats. So these are some stuff that you have to focus on. When you have a marketplace, you might tend to over-govern things. This is something we see in enterprises. Because we are coming with a lot of history of governance, you know, like service-oriented architecture governance, uh, uh, having design time from startup day, you have specifications, you govern the specifications, you govern the APIs or services that you expose and all that stuff. So you should not over-govern things. You should, you should really remove the entry barrier to the marketplace. That's what I'm uh, talking about here. Uh, there can be huge re-engineering costs. So you have to focus on what are the, what are the priorities um, and stuff like that. Right, so, so that provides like an overview of what you can think of and you can categorize things and how you can approach this problem of cleaning your in-house platforms. And really, when you talk about, think about agile, uh, agile way of doing things, having a small team is, is an advantage, right? You have, a, um, you have good communication. So that's what, so the two pizza team, team rule, it's, it's by Amazon. Um, why they ca came up with it is, uh, when you have a small team, you can enable good communication, and everybody knows what everybody is doing, uh, so everybody is synced. And from the API product point of view, the team have to own what they are writing or what they are doing. So in WSO2, there is a mantra that we have: if 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 a team is building a component in a product, uh, let's take the API manager team. If if we are building the uh, the, the policy component or the throttling component, that team needs to own the code, need to write the test, need to think about the build pipeline, need to do the chaos testing, and, uh, and also need to think about how this component observability works. Right? That means they, are, they have to write a plugin uh, that push some events to our event streams and do analysis and show them what's happening. So having a small team, getting the total ownership will really help. And so if you think about the reference implementation, so this is something like uh, something that I'm thinking of. Uh, so you have one enterprise, you have smaller business units, each business units will be exposing their business capabilities through a marketplace. We, we should not restrict those business units to uh, a one platform. They, if, they are, if they want like a private deployment in-house, go for it. If they are more comfortable in Amazon deployment, go for it. Um, they should be operating in their comfortable zone so we can increase the agility. You can have an overall enterprise API marketplace where all these API gateways can push their APIs to that 
global enterprise marketplace. So likewise, uh, it will automatically build a front face to your organization. Uh, so this implementation I have seen a lot of customers doing. Uh, they are in the business unit. Uh, some people are in the business unit level yet, uh, and they are in the process of building that global enterprise marketplace. And you should really think about you know, following the rules of economics. Um, so in the latter part of this presentation, I'm talking about some success use cases. But for, all, for any one of those success useful uh, use cases, I can name an unsuccessful deployment as well. It doesn't mean that when you deploy an API management platform and if you have a nice developer portal, people will start using that. Right? You have to think about uh, incentives uh, and you know, marketing the platform and those kind of things. Um, so if you can provide some social activities, you know, put some leaderboards, these are the uh, business units or guys who's using the APIs, these are the applications that have been built, um, or things like you know, inter-BU, revenue sharing, those kind of things. You can have like monthly hackathons right? uh, and have some kind of um, rewarding mechanism for building some novel innovative application. You can really think about reducing the entry barrier. Some developers doesn't know how to, uh, how to work with OAuth access tokens. So you can have some nice samples uh, educating them to call a token endpoint, get access token, uh, putting it to your application, how to use that. So that's a lot of documentation, um, very intuitive documentation, good samples. Uh, if they are comfortable with JavaScript code, if they are comfortable with Java, Go, whatever language it is, you can provide some nice samples. So lowering the entry barrier is, is, is really the key to get your API platform or the marketplace get going. Transparency is a major thing. So if, you, if, if your platform can provide enough events so people can observe the platform, people can hook their own favorite log systems, log monitoring systems, that's the key. So, uh, we are trying to build all that stuff into the platform. So we are in the next versions of API Manager. We are trying to provide uh, uh, events as much as possible, uh, emit events as much as possible, so you can trap them and observe the platform. Feedback data, troubleshooting data. Uh, if there are errors, you should have defined error codes so the end application developer knows what happened. So those kind of things you can play, you can pay some attention. Room for personalization. So this is also important. So as API platform developers, you might not know how all APIs are used. right? You, you probably will be exposing some product APIs, some services APIs. But an end application developer, they probably need to use three of those APIs together and, and do some, something, something to do with the application. So, so enabling them to deploy something at the edge is an advantage. So this is something that we are working in. Uh, we, we, we are believing that it's a cutting edge uh, way of thinking about this. So an application developer not only just subscribe to an API, they can think about how the orchestration work within a couple of APIs and deploy their own API to their own sandbox kind of a gateway. So uh, with next versions of API Manager, you'll see these features, and no one will talk more about those things. And the governance, you can think about the governance as a participatory thing, not like a mandatory top-down governance approach. Letting the market decide what best and how best it can be used. Uh, so by through versions, through change requests, you can improve the APIs based on those feedback. So governance can be really feedback driven. Uh, then transparency through observability, so you can provide some statistics of what are the most APIs used? What are the most uh, used versions of APIs, et cetera? Uh, uh, and thinking about uh, evolving the APIs through feedback, like ratings, comments. Let the application developers uh, comment on these APIs, comment on the uptime, comment on the usability of these APIs, et cetera. And also compliance through policy enforcement. You can really think about, so some organizations are worried about HIPAA compliance, GDPR. Uh, PSD2, those kind of compliance. So you can do policy enforcement on compliance. So I'll quickly talk about the some real-world implementations. I'm running out of my time. Um, Bank of New York Mellon, 
They did an awesome deployment of their internal API platform. They, they cleaned their in-house API ecosystem and built an enterprise API platform they talked uh, during 2015 conference. Uh, it's called the Nexon platform. It was a news as well. Um, they, they really created an API ecosystem and, and empowered all the application developers in-house to use that platform uh, to create and build applications in-house. Transport uh, for London. It's a London transportation system that runs London Tube, uh, the bus system, everybody, everything. So they have a whole platform uh, deployed, and API uh, management or API marketplace is part of it. So you can uh, check out that talk. Uh, that was 2016 Europe conference. Uh, you can check from WC2 uh, conference uh, website. StubHub was one of the early adopters of WC2 API manager. They did a Awesome deployment of a public API manager platform. Um, so their story is also as a case study. You can uh, you can check what they have done, what their develop, uh, deployment is like, etc. So during this week, you you can probably check out some of the. So the keynote today's keynote was about API platform as well. Um, Eric talked about how Wales Fargo did their API platform. Uh, yesterday, Alan talked about how Micron uh, built their internal API manager platform and exposed those things outside world. Um, Kim, uh, I think it's today that she, he's talking about uh, building an API platform for a government. So these are some interesting talks related to what I talked about. Um, yeah, so that brings us to the end. Uh, so we talked about defining an API strategy. We talked about defining the technology strategy facilitating the consumers, engage and empower producers, evangelize, evangelizing uh, how to make the platform popular, incentives, how to monetize, and govern and manage. All right, so thank you. I can take a couple of questions. All right. So I'll be hanging around uh, in the oxygen tank booth. So if you have any questions, please meet me. Thanks.